Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Uh, if you're moseying about, you can find a seat. We'll get started here in a moment. And I will open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, for adoption through propitiation, for bringing us into your family at the great cost of crushing your son in our place. How could we do any other but be ambassadors for your love, ambassadors of your mercy, ambassadors of your great and glorious good news? Oh God, would you equip us even this morning to be ready on our lips, ready in our hearts, ready in prayer, swift in our feet with the gospel. God, we pray that you would continue and regularly equip this body of believers to go out from this place into every nook and cranny that you place them uh, with the glorious truth of your salvation of sinners. And God, would you be pleased to open ears and soften hearts amongst family members and children, parents, spouses, co-workers, friends, classmates. God, would you be pleased to use this body of believers, weak as we are, as vessels for otherworldly realities, for supernatural power, uh, for your life-altering gospel. And we pray it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Thanks for being here this morning. And we're going to jump into part two of our discussion of evangelism together. And I want to remind us a little bit of where we have been uh, we're thinking about evangelism 101. What are, the, what are the basics of getting out there and sharing the gospel? And fundamentally, I want to free you up to start awkward conversations leading to life. Uh, I want to free us from the mindset that evangelism is for the specialists or the experts, uh, the, the guys who write apologetics textbooks, or the people on YouTube who are really good at it. Uh, evangelism is for us. Evangelism is for every one of us who are redeemed. And so uh, there is an ought to. We looked at that last week. There's also a want to. Uh, and I just want to uh, press by way of a, a really pitiful illustration by comparison. It was in the early 80s and Air Florida Flight 90 uh, was taking off out of an airport in the northeast that was enveloped by an ice storm. And the pilots had decided we need to get the ice removed from the wings and from the engines, and they did so. But there was such a long series of delays getting out to the runway that the airplane collected more ice on the wings and on the engines. And as they pushed the throttles forward, there were some uh, company regulations that didn't let them use all of the throttle that was available. Uh, the airplane barely took off and then could not sustain flight and crashed into the bridge over the icy Potomac River. The crew and all the passengers uh, went in uh, to the icy river, uh, were killed in the crash, except for six. One of the six who survived was a woman named Priscilla Torado, and she was treading water in the icy Potomac River after the plane crashed. And rescuers came and lowered a rope to her, and her hands were so cold and so numb, she could not grip the rope. She was helpless and hopeless. Lenny Skutnik was a, a, a worker at the office, Congressional Office of, of Budget and Management, driving by in his truck, saw the airplane crash, threw off his work boots, and jumped into the river and grabbed Priscilla and then was able to drag her to shore. And she went from absolutely helpless to being saved. Now, if you were in her shoes, what would you think about Lenny Skutnik? If somebody asked you a question about him, would you be embarrassed that you knew him? Would you be ashamed to tell the story? Would you wonder what people thought about you if you said, hey, I was drowning in an icy river and I couldn't do anything for myself and this guy jumped in and pulled me to shore and I'm alive to tell about it? Friends, you need to know that your rescue from sin from its penalty, from its enslaving power, and one day from its very presence in your life 
is worth talking about. And it's worth talking about not just because you were in dire straits and you got rescued, but because your Savior is no Lenny Skutnik. This is the great Almighty God, the holy judge of sin, who came in the flesh and died in your place, Christian, to bring you to himself. This is indescribable grace, immeasurable love. It's worth boasting in. And it's worth talking about. He's worth knowing and making known. The encouragement for evangelism that I want you to hear more than any other is that Jesus is worth talking about. Walk into conversations with your heart filled with a love for Christ, renewed with a fresh take on your own salvation, as if you had just been pulled out of the icy Potomac River. And tell people what He has done for you. That is, that is my encouragement to you this morning. Last week we looked at some methods of evangelism and again, that was not an exhaustive list. Many of you shared with me this week other methods of evangelism that you have used, um, maybe even methods of evangelism by which you were saved. Uh, and I'll introduce some of those to you later this morning. At the end of our time last week, we began looking at platforms for evangelism. Platforms for evangelism. And what I mean by a platform is something like a foundation on which you stand when you tell other people about Christ. And the first one we looked at last week was an obedient life. An obedient life. An obedient life serves as a platform for the gospel. Your obedient life is not the gospel. It's not the message of the gospel. It's not the power of the gospel. But it is a platform for the gospel. And the opposite of having an obedient life would be having a disobedient life, a, a life of hypocrisy, a life that actually becomes what the Bible would call a scandal. Uh, the Greek word for scandal is scandal, scandalon. It means a stumbling block, something that trips somebody up over the truths that you're saying about Jesus when your life lives contrary. So an obedient life, a life surrendered to Christ, we're not talking about a life of perfection, we're talking about a, a life yielded to God in faith, which means doing what God says, and when we don't, we're on short accounts and we repent, we live a life of integrity, not hypocrisy. And Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. So an obedient life is a platform for the gospel. Second platform for the gospel, and here's where we'll start this morning, is a separated life. A separated life. Turn to Acts chapter 5. This is a fascinating scene in a period of explosive evangelistic endeavor. Lots of people are coming to Christ in the era we're about to see. And there's something very counterintuitive in Acts chapter 5. Sometimes we think about a separated life. We, we think about Christians that are too weird to be appreciated. <laughs> they're, they're just sort of different than the rest of the world. And, and who would follow a kook? Who, who would follow somebody that just eats different, dresses different, talks different than everybody else. I mean, don't we need to be relatable? How will we have bridges to the culture if we're not like the culture? Have you heard these arguments or felt these pressures? I'm with sailors. I need to swear like a sailor so they know I'm a normal guy and they'll embrace Christ. No, that's not the biblical pattern. Acts 5 presents a really remarkable paradigm you need to see. Look at verse 13. None of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people were holding them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers in the Lord were added to their number, multitudes of men and women. Okay, let's, let's put some observations together here for a moment. Outsiders didn't dare associate with the church, and yet they esteemed them. And people who became insiders joined. In other words, people went from outsiders to insiders by believing the gospel and more were added to their number. What is the scene in Acts chapter 5? The, the scene is effectively God's discipline 
of Christian hypocrisy in the church. Ananias and Sapphira were guilty of lying to the Holy Spirit. They wanted to be as cool as Barnabas, who sold a piece of land and gave 100% of the proceeds to the benefit of the church. Everybody admired Barnabas. Let's be like him. I've got some land. It's worth $10,000. We'll, we'll sell it. No, I got the math wrong already. It's worth something more than $10,000. I gave $10,000. It was worth more than that, but I wanted everybody to think that I gave 100% of the proceeds. Ananias and Sapphira were not required to sell their land. They were not required to give 100%. They could have given 2% or 28.5%. It didn't matter. The point is they wanted people to believe they were something they were not. And God dropped them in the assembly. The husband first, then the wife. Stunning implication is that God takes sin seriously. Now, why would you want to be a part of that crowd? If you're not a believer. Christians were to live differently. They were to be demonstrably different in the eyes of the world. That's a group of people who, they don't want to be hypocrites. Uh, they, they want to be holy before the Lord. And their holiness before the Lord means a separated life that looks different than the world. A different kind of integrity coming from the heart. Listen, you know this as a Christian. Maybe in the workplace, your integrity means a certain kind of work ethic that makes lazy people in your office just a little nervous. Maybe even a threat. Maybe you've lost a job because the people without integrity were threatened by your integrity in the workplace. It is appropriate for a Christian to look different. Maybe this is true in your own home. Your, your Christian life, your keeping a close account with God means that you live different, talk different, have different desires, set different priorities for your life in a home with people that don't know the Lord. And that different kind of life becomes something of a hostility, something of a threat. The world ought to look in on Christian lives and not say, oh, they're just like us. What does the, what does the church have to offer the world if it's no different than the world? Relevance? Relevance is not the power of the gospel. By the way, far more relevant to the needs of the world is a different kind of life produced by the Holy Spirit with a different terminus. There's a way that seems right to a man and the end of it is death. The world needs something different than the path they're already on. So when the church looks like the world, it surrenders the advantage of advertisement. This church did not surrender that. The platform for the gospel in Acts 5 was a separated life. The outside world looking in said, I'm not going in there unless I repent and believe. Then I want to be a part of them. It's actually effective. This is counterculture. A simultaneous repulsion and attraction. Listen to the words of Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be squeezed into the shape or the mold of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is the task. In Romans chapter 2, Paul describes those who lived, uh, said they loved God with their lips, but lived contrary to God in their lives, and the world blasphemed God as a result. The Christian life on the other hand, is totally different. This, by the way, is not a retreat mindset for the Christian life, uh, sort of a medieval monasticism. Uh, the monastics were those who said, I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to be squeezed into the world's mold. I know what I'll do. I'll move out into the desert like a hermit and live by myself. That's not the Great Commission. <laughs> And the problem with that is you take whatever vestiges of the world are in your heart with you out into the desert, out into the monastery. You don't actually solve sin by monasticism. You actually remove yourself from the fundamental reason you're on the earth. Now, I don't think anybody in this room is a medieval monastic, but there are ways we can sort of retreat into the holy huddle where our only exposure is with Christians all the time. That's not the design of the church. The design of the church is to gather, be equipped, and scatter. Right? To be drawn in, built up, send out, as we say it around here. Listen to Micah chapter 4 and verse 5. 
Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God, forever and ever. That is a counterculture anthem. And do you know it's attractive? I think particularly in our day, the postmodern era, where postmodern thought has sort of had its way in our culture. Um, everybody has their own truth. It's all perspectival. Everything's relative. Or maybe there's no such thing as truth. It's actually a very good time to be standing up and saying, no, there is truth. I know him. And you can know him too. And it feels something a little bit like the emperor's new clothes. You remember the story. The emperor was naked, but the people, convinced, the people were convinced, oh, you need to go along with the lie that he's got wonderful, beautiful clothes, and everybody should just say it all the time. And finally, someone stands up and says, I don't think he's wearing anything. There's a magnetic draw to that truth because everybody already knows it. Here's the reality. Everybody already knows there's, tr there's right and wrong. There is truth and error. That relativism falls apart and postmodernism is phony through and through. The idea that you can have your truth and I can have my truth doesn't work in the real world, only in the theoretical, made-up, philosophical world where people try to get away with what they want to do. To be different than that, to be countercultural, to say, you can go after those gods, I'm following Yahweh, has a unique attraction in a postmodern world. Don't surrender it. Don't give up, Christian, and think, oh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That this exclusive message is offensive, therefore I need to soften the message. Actually, that exclusive message is attractive in all the right ways. It means there is hope. Anybody following some other path for satisfaction or to be done with guilt or, or to find their way to heaven only ends in disaster. Think of all the philosophies of men, all the, all the books that have been written, all the philosophical methodologies that have been attempted. And if you've taken a philosophy course or if you've majored in philosophy, you know you have to study the philosophers, plural. Why? Because everyone that came along, every different philosophical school of thought, said all those other philosophies were wrong. I have the wisdom. And it's just an endless train of differing ideas. And you read all of those men who wrote those things, and typically the terminus of their earthly existence was confusion and questions, rather than confidence in some liberating truth. Hold up the truth. Be different. Let's talk about another platform for evangelism. Christian love. Christian love. And by this I mean a, a general love that flows out of what it means to be a Christian. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. To be a Christian is to be one who is filled by love by the Holy Spirit, whom God shed abroad on our hearts, Romans chapter 5. And that love is a love for God because He first loved us, and it is a love for others that flows out of us horizontally. The Christian ought to be marked by love, and that love is seen tangibly in what we do. Compassion, kindness, tenderness towards others, selfless sacrifice. But I also mean something specific as an evangelistic platform in our love for one another, particularly love for believers. Jesus said in John 13, 35, that the world will know that you belong to me if you love one another. In other words, the world ought to look in on the church, on followers of Jesus Christ, and see a radical kind of love that they have for each other. It's a kind of love the world can't touch. You think about marriages outside of Christ, and, and in our day, they have essentially become a, a sort of a bargain. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. But as soon as you cross me, I have an out. We even have this no contest divorce thing. When there's an offense, we're just gone. When we don't like each other, we're just gone. And the world's bonds of love are, are like that. Christian love is selfless and sacrificial. Paul says love never fails. It endures. 
We are to have this kind of love for one another, and and that is the identifying mark of the Christian life, that Christians love Christians in this way. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. And this is important. Sometimes um, general Christian love is seen as a platform for the gospel, and, and what is meant by that is some sort of social transformation. If Christians can cure poverty in the world, then the world will be attracted to Christians and their message. I would suggest that's actually not the case. Anything that a Christian can do that the world can do is not an exclusive platform for the gospel. The world could cure poverty. There are, there are I'm not, I don't have high hopes for that. It is conceivably, hypothetically possible to have tools to end things like poverty. That is not the church's mission. It's not unique to the church's ability. But Christian love is unique to Christian ability. Galatians 6.10 says this, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Paul says, do good to all people. Then he uses this little word, especially, and especially has sort of lost its meaning in English, Uh, especially we sort of take as this subset. I love ice cream, especially bluebell homemade vanilla. There was only one amen to that? (laughs) And you get the idea that I love all kinds of ice cream, And among those all kinds of ice cream, I really like Blue Bell's homemade vanilla. But actually what I'm intending to say by that is, I love ice cream, and let me tell you particularly the kind of ice cream I'm thinking about right now, Blue Bell's homemade vanilla. It's like particularly or specially. That's the way that word is used here. Paul says, let us not lose heart in doing good, While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Which all people is he talking about? Let me tell you who I'm talking about. The household of faith. Particularly, he's zeroing in on an application of love that he intends for believers to follow. This is to be the mark of the Christian. By the way, that's not to exclude what should you do when you meet an unbeliever in need. Meet a need. What should you do with everybody that comes across your path? Express genuine, selfless, sacrificial love. But our love for believers ought to be of the highest mark and actually ought to be an identifying mark of what it means to be a Christian. Um, What good is it if the world looks in on the church and sees the church neglecting the needs and opportunities for love in its own household in order to be attractional to people it doesn't know, people it's not in relationship with. Um, You kind of on the outside would have to say, why would I want to be a part of that group when you're abandoning love for that group to try to get more in your group? That is counterproductive. The the countercultural kind of love that only Christians can have by the power of God is itself a platform for the gospel. Let me give you another platform. It is your eschatology. Eschatology is a platform. Christians are described in 2 Timothy 4.8 as those who love his appearing. Those who love his appearing. There Paul, some of his last words are, I'm confident the Lord will give me the crown of life, not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Uh, the crown of life is the reward of eternal life for every believer. The ones who love His appearing, long for His appearing, eagerly await His arrival, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, are all descriptions of a Christian. A Christian has been born again to long for something that will not be fulfilled until you go to be with Him or He returns. This is a fundamental disposition of the Christian life. What does it mean when you and I have our eyes fixed on the return of Christ? We wake up and we say, could it be today? The day of the Lord is near. Last time with a flood, next time by fire. Watch out. It changes how we live. If you live according to Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. 
from which we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power He has to subject all things to His Lordship, will transform our mortal bodies into conformity with His glorious resurrection body. If you live according to that truth, you'll look different in the world. You'll set your affections on things differently. It will change the way you work. It will change uh, how you think about whom you marry, what job to take, how you do your job. It will change the way you recreate. It will change your priorities. It will change the way you save and spend money. A Christian's life will be fundamentally different based on eschatology. What are you looking forward to? Jesus told his followers, pray this, your kingdom come. What is that? That is a yearning and a longing that things would be different on this earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is a recognition that this is not my home. My citizenship is in heaven. That the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom. It's what I'm living for. To be an ambassador of the king is to proclaim his message in his absence. But he won't always be absent. He's coming back. Evangelism fundamentally is the king who came once and laid down his life to pay for my sins is coming back and you need to know him. Let me tell you about him. Interestingly, in the earthly ministry of Christ, the word evangelism, uh, the, the, the Greek word euangolizomai, it, it means the proclaiming of good news. The proclaiming of good news or the evangelism in Jesus' earthly ministry was often tied to the kingdom. Preach the good news of the kingdom, the coming kingdom. Uh, and, and it was appropriate when the king was here to preach the nearness of the kingdom. And then Jesus told parables saying that, well, the king's going to go away and the kingdom's going to come later. But it's interesting that good news is tied to the identity of the king and the presence of the king here. That is great and wonderful news. Unless your sins aren't forgiven. That gets us to substitutionary atonement and the good news that the king came the first time to pay for the sins of everyone who would believe. This is what we must proclaim. Let me give you a final platform for the gospel. Again, these platforms are not necessarily the content of the gospel, but they are the, the platforms, the foundations from which we preach the gospel. And the last one is suffering. Turn to John chapter 9. Suffering is a platform for the gospel. And the question here is not, will you suffer? Of course you will suffer. You might be tempted to think, oh, I don't suffer. Uh, the severe trials are, are what my, my friend is going through, and so my suffering doesn't really count. I would just say whatever you're going through that's hard counts. And, and the question is not, are you suffering or will you suffer? The real question is, how will you suffer? Will you endure suffering, trials, persecutions, difficulties, illness, waiting for something that you long for? The question is, how well do you do that? With what focus do you do that? Look at John chapter 9, verse 3. Jesus said of a man born blind, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but his blindness was so that the works of God might be manifested in him. And we rejoice. Man born blind, it wasn't because he sinned or his parents did something wrong that's a direct cause of his blindness. It's so that Jesus could demonstrate his lordship over blindness and rescue one of his own sheep out of hypocritical religion. That's great news. What if you're the blind guy? We don't know how old he is. We, we don't know how long he's suffered, but his entire earthly existence has been without sight. Jesus opens his eyes and, and the first one he sees is Jesus. That's great, but we forget the suffering in it sometimes. Why did he suffer? In the sovereign plan of God, so that the works of God might be revealed in him. Listen, you and I do not know the ultimate reasons um, why we suffer in any individual case, other than God is good and he will get glory for himself. 
why he brings particular sufferings into particular believers' lives, we don't know. But oftentimes it's not about us. And our response to suffering in those things becomes a platform for the gospel. If you've endured illness, difficulty, you found yourself in the hospital, you've experienced some sort of trial, and medical workers are caring for you, and they notice, uh, why are you the only one in this ward that's singing? (laughs) Why do you have joy? Didn't, Didn't you just hear the diagnosis that I gave to you? What's wrong with you? No, no, no. What's right with me? Can I tell you? It's the Lord. Your suffering becomes a tremendous platform for the gospel. If you haven't done it, I want you to look up on the GBC website, Matt Dodd's sermons. From when he was diagnosed with cancer um, to when he realized, I, I'm not going to get out of this. His response to suffering has become a platform for the gospel from which the gospel still goes. And yours can be as well. Look at John 11, verse 4. Mary and Martha sent people to Jesus and said, the one you love is sick. Tells us a couple of things. Um, Jesus is away, but he has a friend that Lazarus was known as, as one for whom Jesus had fond affections during his earthly ministry. That's just stunning to see the, the palette of emotions in Christ in his earthly ministry. That Lazarus felt loved and Mary and Martha felt loved specially by Jesus in this friendship relationship. And Jesus was away when Lazarus got sick. Can you imagine having followed Jesus around in all of his earthly ministry and see him heal people left and right? All the sick came to him and everybody that had a demon, everybody that had a sickness was healed. And Lazarus, whom Jesus specially loves, gets sick. Oh, where where was Jesus? I think this is why the sisters say, if you had been here, Lazarus would be well. I don't think they're saying, if you had just been here, I don't think they're snippy. (laughs) I think they're expressing faith and confidence. Jesus, if you had been here, there's just like this spotlight around you where diseases just run away and Lazarus would be well. Jesus was away. Look at verse 4. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness is not to end in death. And if you know the story of John 11, you go, wait a second, uh, Lazarus died. But you also know that's not the end. <laughs> it doesn't end there. But it is for the glory of God. Lazarus getting sick is for the glory of God. Why? So that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Is that your heart in your suffering? Lord Jesus, would you be glorified in my suffering? You're, you're sovereign. You're good. Complaint undermines the platform. Do we understand? Trust in God, in the suffering, is a platform for the good news. It is a tangible witness that you believe Him. It's a manifestation of your faith. Look at verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when He heard that Lazarus was sick, He snapped His fingers from a distance. No, no, no. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he transported himself like he did from one place to another across the lake. Or he walked really fast. No, none of those things. What does the verse say? When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he then stayed two days in the place where he was. Wait, you, you heard that your friend whom you love was sick? You, you who heal all diseases? Jesus intentionally stayed away so that Lazarus could die. By the time Jesus got there, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. The King James Bible says he stinketh. It was proof to everybody that Lazarus was truly dead, not in a coma, so that Jesus could demonstrate his power over death in Lazarus' life. 
stunning when you think about God's purposes for suffering. And when you're suffering, we're not quick to feel those things. But I want to encourage you to embrace suffering as an effective platform for truth-telling, for good news proclamation. Can you say with Martin Luther, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also? What a great anthem for life. Take my stuff. You need to know Christ. It's an otherworldly perspective. All right, fourthly, uh, let's look at the content of evangelism. What do we need to say? It, it's not enough to smile at people, be nice to people. It's not enough to stand on one of these platforms we just talked about. The gospel requires proclamation. There must be words. There must be content. We, we can't give a wrong message. We can't proclaim the wrong way to salvation. We don't want to confuse the way of salvation. I don't believe there's a script or a formula you must use. I'm going to give you some outline points, some headings to think about to sort of corral your thoughts. But if you read the New Testament, if you read your Bible, you know there's not just one way the good news is proclaimed. There are many ways, many angles, there are many parables, there are many metaphors, many pictures, a rich palette of vocabulary words. Uh, you think about words like justification, salvation, adoption, reconciliation, redemption. In Romans 3, 21 to 25, they all show up in the same place. But in, in all the other places where the gospel is preached, they're scattered about. <laughs> the gospel can be faithfully preached in, in so many different ways, so many different combinations of words. Uh, many have used the Romans road. Uh, maybe you've done that before. You think Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And you go to Romans 10, you must confess and believe. Uh, many have used the, the entire book of Romans. Can I invite you to read Romans? And then let's talk about it. It is the unfolding of God's gospel plan. Uh, some of my friends and heroes have used the Ten Commandments as a starting point which is a great intro, especially in, in uh, Western civilization, our culture that's familiar with the Ten Commandments. Uh, they, they show up in courtrooms. Uh, you know, Charlton Heston came down the mountain in Hollywood and, and the big beard. And, and, and people know that there's such a thing as the Ten Commandments. And, and maybe you've seen the Way of the Master guys on, um, on YouTube videos, or, or maybe you've seen them in person. I'll never forget when um, uh, a, a famous Hollywood actor... Uh, turned believer, uh, spoke at a conference. Some of you were there, and, and it was a conference on evangelism. And he put his personal phone number up on the screen and said, I share the gospel on these dates at Santa Monica Pier or in Pasadena uh, on these days of the week. Come with me, and we'll just go talk to people about Christ. Just wonderful. And, and, and the, the method that they typically use is, hey, do you know the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah, I know the Ten Commandments. Do you know what they are? Uh... No. Do you keep them? Oh, yeah, I keep them. Wait, you just said you don't know what they are. Can I tell you what they are? And you just start going through some of them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a good person. Well, have you lied, stolen, coveted, committed adultery? Or by Jesus' definition, lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery already. Um, so what you're saying to me is you're a, a lying, coveting, adulterer. You're, you're not good with God. You need a savior. That's a good method. I love the sharing of a testimony. And, and what I mean by this is a, a testimony where you're telling your story, sort of your truncated biography, with the facts of the gospel, right? It's not enough just to tell your story. You know, I was born in 1974 as a dark and stormy night and a bunch of things happened to me and now here I am. Uh, you need to get to the gospel in your testimony, but your testimony is a very effective tool for telling people not just bare facts about how God saves sinners, but the experiential facts of how God saved this sinner. And, and your story doesn't save somebody else, but God saved you as a trophy of His grace, 
to be an ambassador of his power. I love the chronological Bible teaching model of evangelism. You know, this is what Zach Ken has employed in Papua New Guinea. It takes a long time. Six weeks, a couple hours teaching every day to get through it. But it starts in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and goes through the creation and the creation of man and the Garden of Eden and then the fall and the, the, the proto-gospel, the, the, the first statements of the gospel in Genesis 3.15 that, that, to, that God says to Satan, the woman will bear a seed that will crush your head. There's the promise that God will reverse the curse, undo the effects of sin, and defeat our mortal enemy. And then we're looking for that seed promise. Who is it? Well, it was, it's got to be Cain or Abel. No, Abel's dead, Cain's a murderer. It's got to be Seth. No, it's not him, he's a sinner. And you go through the whole seed line, the generations, the genealogies, and you're, and you're just looking for that one who's going to fulfill the promise. Is it Noah? Nope, it's not him. And you're, you're reading your Bible sort of left to right as if you've never read it before. I, I first heard about this method of evangelism from New Tribes by an evangelism professor I had in seminary. I was so fascinated by it, I thought, oh man, I need to move to Papua New Guinea and do this sometime. Uh, full circle, I just love that that's one of the things our church is doing and has sent some of our families to do. But I met a 16-year-old kid in Nashville. Um, he had lived in Nashville his whole life. He only spoke English. He was a local in the buckle of the Bible belt. And I met him and I started talking to, talking to him about Jesus, and I was getting the strangest blank face. I said, do you know who Jesus is? And he only knew the word Jesus as a swear word, something you say when you're mad. That's what he had learned at home. That's all he ever knew, never heard anything different. In Nashville, Tennessee. And, and I had grown accustomed to, you know, a difference between California, where you're, you're trying to convince people to be Christians, to Nashville, Tennessee, where you're trying to convince people that they're not Christians, and they need to be. And here I meet this kid who only knows Jesus as a swear word. And I said, well, did you know that, that Jesus is, a, is the name of a person? It's actually the name of a person who lived here on the earth a long time ago. It, it was actually God who became a man and came to the earth. And, and the 16 year old was like, uh, I've never heard that before. Where have you been? Even Hollywood gets some of that out there somewhere. Um, do you mind if I tell you about him? He said, I'd love to hear that. I said, do you have four hours? Sure. So we got coffee and then eventually we moved to my living room at my house and we just did this four hour version of the gospel, not the Romans road, but Genesis 1-1. And I didn't tell him the answers. I just went through the progress of history. And we kept thinking, okay, it's not Noah. Ugh. Abraham, not him either. Not Moses. Oh, it's got to be David. No, it's not him. David's son, 2 Samuel 7, yes, but then that's Solomon. It's not him. Disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. 400 silent years, John the Baptist. It's got to be him. Guy wears weird clothes, telling people to repent, eats weird food. It's not him. He says, I'm not even worried to untie Messiah's shoes. And we'd gone through the sacrificial system and, 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 and animal sacrifice. And so when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we'd cover that ground already. And so this kid is tracking. He said, okay, whoever John's pointing at, that's him. We walk through Jesus' earthly life, his ministry, his teachings, and then his death. And in his death, you're, you have all this hope built up and then his death is a disappointment. You don't understand yet, that's the answer. And then the resurrection, and then the proclamation of this message about Christ to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the age. Um, and, and he just said, I, I've never heard any of this before. I would commend to you, if you have the opportunity to, to, to preach the gospel in, a, in sort of the, the gospel tract that God gave, <laughs> to do that. Um, it, it's a good reminder to not make assumptions you know, in Papua New Guinea, the, the real danger is that we talk about God, sin, salvation, repentance, faith, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They have words for those things. They have understandings of those things. But in an animistic culture, in an ancestor worship culture, in a syncretistic culture that has some Lutheranism thrown in with worshiping the sticks and rocks and great-grandfather, those words don't have meaning they at least don't have the same meanings that we intend. So I would just encourage you, 
Don't assume that Christian cliche will translate or that the rich biblical vocabulary will have meaning. You may have to do some explaining. I always wanted to, to meet a practicing Jew and ask them their take on Isaiah 53. I've had a couple opportunities to do that. That's a, that's a great question. You meet, you meet somebody and say, I'm Jewish. Great. I like, do, do you read the Bible? Do you, did, did you go to Jewish school? Yeah. What do you make of Isaiah 53? And just open and start reading it together. I read a book a number of years ago called Tactics. Um, I wouldn't recommend the theology uh, tracing through the whole of that book, but the, the methodology that Greg Kukul uh, recommends is one of asking questions um, as a lead-in. Um, just get to know a person. The great advantage of doing that is you get to hear their worldview before you speak into it. The proverb says that if you speak before you hear, it is a folly and a shame. I think there's a truth to that in evangelism. Proclamation without knowing what's going on in the heart of the audience, you can be faithful, that can be great. But getting to know somebody and drawing them out and bringing the truths of the gospel to bear in their actual lives is a huge benefit. There's also a tactical advantage if you ask somebody a lot of questions uh, I, after, like the week after I read that book, I met a guy in a park uh, who was wearing a, an Emirates t-shirt and he sort of looked like he wasn't from around here, talked like he wasn't from around here. I said, hey, how long have you been in Arizona? Uh, about a month. Where'd you come from? UAE? Great. Hey, have you found a church home since you've been here? <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, I, I go to the mosque down the street over here sometimes. I said, oh, so you're a Muslim. Hey, I've always wanted to know, um, from a Muslim perspective, how do you get to heaven? And he described the five pillars of Islam. I said, have you done those? Yeah. Uh, no. How, how would a Muslim know that he was going to heaven? I just ask a lot of questions. I want to know him. By the way, you ought to know that um, not every Muslim believes what every other Muslim believes. Don't just paint a paint a Islam picture that you learned uh, somewhere over an individual. Draw him out, get to know him. What is his individual worldview? I, I asked him so many questions, and he was just talking, that eventually he felt awkward about it, and he said, say, uh, what about you? How do you think people get to heaven? Oh, thanks for asking, Bible. You know, I like that strategy. Uh, some people take a survey, uh, don't be honest, uh, sorry, don't be honest, that, that came out wrong. Don't be dishonest. I'm taking a survey that uh, I'm making it sound like it's gonna be published in the next US News and World Report. Um, but sometimes, uh, hey, we're, I'm just asking people what they think about spiritual things. You, you wanna answer some questions? Um, that can be a good lead in. Breaking the ice is the hard part. We talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, at some level, Hey, uh, can I talk to you about Jesus? Is okay. <laughs> Sometimes we get hung up on the ice breaking part. I need the perfect lead in so that someone will engage with me in the gospel. I don't think there's a perfect one. Really good strategy for evangelism is to have children. You know they're a captive audience. Just have some. <laughs> get them in your home. Preach the gospel. Stand on those platforms, suffer in front of them, live obedient lives before them, uh, live separated lives in front of them, and explain with words the gospel over and over and over and over again. Don't grow weary of that. How many times did you hear the gospel before you believed? Some of you will go, first time I heard it clearly, I believed. And some of you will say, somebody persevered with me over and over and over again. Some of you will say, I sat in church for 27 years and heard it every week. And then God opened my eyes. So just be relentless, stay with it. Um, adopt children, it's a good strategy. Again, captive audience. Adoption is very biblical. If you're a believer, you've been adopted. You were born in the wrong family, spiritually speaking, 
and you were rescued and brought into God's family, made a son or a daughter in love. There's a theology in that. Uh, Foster parent is another good strategy for evangelism. Um, I can't think of a harder one. I've never done it. The, The thought of it tears the seams of my soul. What does it mean to foster? It means to jump into the great sort of orphan crisis in our age, in our society. Children that are at home in the foster care system, from house to house, oftentimes from abusive situation to abusive situation, wards of the state, they need gospel love. They need to be in gospel homes. They typically come with difficult, challenging, emotional, and physical difficulties. Um, Foster parents love like few others. I would encourage you. At some point this year, we'll get another equipping hour from David Britton, and he'll explain that situation in our state, in our country, the needs, the opportunities, how to be involved in it. Some of you sent me some other um, venues for evangelism this week. Um, Jen Herbranson, I didn't ask her if I could use her name. It's too late. Um, she said, get outside and walk your dog. Um, start a neighborhood book study. Um, and then she mentioned foster care. Not just for the selfless love that it takes for foster parents, but to the children, but also with CPS workers, with therapy workers, people in and out of your house all of the time. The way that you selflessly love becomes an opportunity for many gospel conversations. She also suggested mentoring. Uh, Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've uh, taken somebody who needed uh, specific sort of life mentoring uh, or athletic mentoring or academic mentoring officially or unofficially, and just put your life in their life and use that as an opportunity for the gospel. Uh, Someone else submitted um, uh, Halloween. Halloween is a a unique uh, feature in Arizona. It's it's warm enough and cool enough simultaneously that people go outside in Arizona, and many neighborhoods just become a a, a walkway and a pathway, uh, sitting in your driveway, starting conversations, handing out gospel tracts, uh, a great way to share the gospel. And I think in some neighborhoods, it might be the only time you meet your neighbors. Uh, American suburbia, garage doors open, cars pull in, garage doors shut, you never see anybody. Uh, we don't just sit out on the porch and hang out with each other very often. Uh, but there are a couple of events that are these social things throughout the year where that's an opportunity. Um, when you're waiting in line, Somewhere, striking up a conversation. Again, awkward, (laughs) but uh, often effective. Corey uh, gave me permission to share uh, this story. She she has written um, probably five or six hundred letters, evangelistic letters, to people in her life, people that she's known. One of the great advantages of, of writing a letter is you sort of get to get the content you want with the personal touch uninterrupted. Um, and, it, and it's not forgotten, it's, it's there in print. Uh, perhaps you've taken that opportunity. And, and Corey shared with me this week that um, she had a difficult relationship with her mom and had shared the gospel a number of times and was resisted. And and she wasn't really feeling like sharing the gospel with her mom. And a friend encouraged her just one last time. And so they prayed, she prayed. Um, The last three days of her mom's life on earth were believing days. So don't miss those opportunities. Um, If if you've been stiff-armed by someone you love over the gospel, keep going. Heard just this week of another deathbed conversion by one who was there at the right place, right time to deal with someone who was suffering and someone who had resisted the gospel who then heard the gospel one more time and believed. 
there are many more. Perhaps you've thought of others. Um, let's, let's talk quickly about the content of the gospel. I'll give you five points which sort of serve as an outline for the way I think about the gospel to make sure I'm not leaving something out, right? You're not explaining the gospel if you're not dealing with sin, if you're not talking about God, if you don't talk about the cross, if you don't deal with faith and repentance, right? So those things become critical. Here's my five points. God, sin, the cross, faith, God. Here's what I mean by that. Starting with God, a right understanding of who he is. You're not going to exhaust this, right? You, you, can't, you can't say everything there is to say about God. But the fact that God is holy and he has a perfect standard that we cannot meet butts up against the second part of the gospel, which is the condition of man. Total depravity means every aspect of the human constitution is affected by sin. It, it means spiritual inability Man does not have the ability to clean himself up, to pick himself up by his moral bootstraps, to solve his own problem. Man is hopeless and helpless and dead in his transgressions and sins. And he needs something outside of himself. And that leads to the third point, which is the cross of Christ. Jesus died for me. Jesus died in the place of the sinner. Substitution is the foundation of this good news. We've only had bad news when we start with how holy God is and how sinful man is, but now we get to good news in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. It's the only way anybody can be saved. And that comes by faith and repentance. Those two words are twin sides of the same coin. Faith is to believe in Jesus, to believe only in Jesus, to believe totally in Jesus, to pay for your sins. Repentance is a turning away from all other beliefs, a turning away from all other gods, a turning away from living for myself, a turning away from sin, and a turning to Christ. It's a 180 degree turn. That comes with counting the, cross, counting the cost of following Christ, taking up your cross and following Him. Faith and repentance is not mental assent. It is affirming that Jesus is my only hope and I give up everything to have him. That's faith and repentance. And then that leads to the last point, which is back to God himself. And the reason I list God again as the fifth point in my outline is I want to remember the good news of the good news. The good news of the gospel is not God's holy, you are a sinner, Jesus died in your place, repent and believe. Now you're forgiven. All of that up to that point merely qualifies you to be in God's glorious presence and not be incinerated, but to be clothed in white robes, to, to have your robes washed in the blood of Jesus, to belong to Him, to be qualified to be in His presence so that you may enjoy Him. The good news of the gospel is that we get God. J.I. Packer summarized this five-point outline with three words. I like this one too. Adoption through propitiation. In his book, Knowing God, he defined the gospel in three words. That's another way I think about the gospel. As I'm talking to somebody, I'm going adoption through propitiation. What does that remind me of? Um, it means uh, the, the sinner's not in the right family. The sinner needs to belong to God. That adoption is a matter of a love relationship to God that you don't currently have. And the only way you get it is by propitiation. That is, a satisfying of God's wrath through the substitute death of Jesus Christ. Those three words help me get the whole thing in there. So whatever you need to do to remember the facts of the gospel, um, we've got to have those in there. I would also say, don't be afraid of the whole Bible. Don't be afraid of content beyond those four or five gospel points. A principle we'll talk about next time, we'll come back to evangelism two weeks from now, is you don't know the heart of the person you're talking to. You don't know the sticking point. You don't know what the, the hang-up is, but the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it is able to pierce and divide thoughts and intentions. When you're speaking with an unbeliever, you, you don't know the flavor of the unbelief. What, what is their sticking point? Do they need to surrender from self-rule? Um, they, do they need to find satisfaction in God rather than satisfaction in temporal things? 
Uh, Are they filled up with self-righteousness, I'm good enough? Or are they racked with guilt they don't know what to do with? You see, we, we preach the gospel, we can't see the heart. God knows the heart. And the Word of God is able to penetrate the heart. So in one sense, tell them everything. I don't know what's going to stick. And the reality is we're not done making the gospel clear until an unbeliever has heard enough to reject or refuse. Does that make sense? If I tell people, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life, an unbeliever could hear that and go, great, and stay right where they're at. I, I want to I get to a confrontation of where they're at, somehow, some way. The difficulty is I'm finite, I don't know what it is. God sees the heart, I don't. So employ the word of God. We don't know what the sticking point is. They certainly need to appropriate their sin personally before a holy God to embrace the gospel. All right, we will pause there and we will come back in two weeks and uh, talk more about evangelism. We'll see you in about 15 minutes for main service.